Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second series or next series of MCON Soil webinars. We had a very successful series last autumn, as uh, quite a lot of you will know, focusing on PFAS and uh, mainly also the PFAS crisis we, we saw in Flanders. Um, there were many, many of you who were very interested in also having more of those webinars. Um, and this season, we are going to broaden our scope and also going to address other aspects of emerging soil contaminants as also most of you know, alas, we are confronted with more than just the PFAS, even though that's quite a serious problem. Um, today we have two presenters from the University of Antwerp. Um, Lieven Bervoets is a full professor at the Department of Biology of the University of Antwerp, who has been active as an ecotoxicologist for more than 35 years. His main expertise is studying the presence and bioavailability of micropollutants, including metals, pesticides, organochlorine compounds and PFAS in both terrestrial and aquatic environment. After leaving, we will have a presentation by Dr. Timo Groffen. He is a young postdoctoral researcher specialized in the field of ecotoxicology. He mainly studies the environmental fate and behavior, bioaccumulation, biomagnification and toxicity of PFAS in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. In addition, he has developed and validated several analytical methods to analyze PFAS in complex abiotic and biotics. Um, I was muted by somebody. OK, sorry for that. Um, OK, as you see, we have two very big experts in this field, um, and I'm very glad that those two gentlemen are very willing to present on us a two presentations on micropollutants of concern, presence in the environment, bioaccumulation and ecotoxicological, ecotoxicological consequences. Two presentations, that means that first we have a presentation by Leven, presentation of about 20 minutes. After that, we have 10 minutes for Q&A. And at half past one, then our next presenter, Timo, will start with a second presentation also of about 20 minutes. Leven, the floor is all yours. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, yep, that's fine. OK, thank you for this introduction. And indeed, uh, Timo and I, we will talk about micropollutants of concern and they're mainly stressing their bioavailability and their uh, ecological effects. And I will start with a more general introduction and give some examples on uh, more from the aquatic environment, whereas it, as far as I know, Timo will more stress on PFAS and more in the terrestrial environment. And before I start, I would like to, to go to a small questionnaire. And I listed here three molecules. And I'm going to ask you which of these molecules are, uh, are the most toxic uh, according to yourself. And these are sodium chloride, DDT, and PFOS. So maybe people can raise their hand if they think that sodium chloride is the most toxic of these three compounds. So who thinks sodium chloride is the most toxic? I see already a couple of hands. Okay. Then maybe remove the hand. So these were five people that think sodium uh, six <laughs> in the meantime. So please move, remove your hands. Who thinks that DDT is the most toxic of these three compounds? Okay, already a lot more people, 30 for the moment. So please remove your hands. Yeah, this is a little bit strange. <laughs> Still five hands are there. So who thinks it's PFOS, that's the most toxic of these three compounds. So we have 
about six or seven for sodium chloride, about 30 for DDT and 10 for PFOS, and what things that you cannot tell. Okay, 16 people think you cannot tell, and indeed, I think I didn't provide enough information to be able to make a, a, a ranking of these three compounds, because there is a lot of information that you need in order to decide if a, com a compound or a chemical is toxic. And the first one is the concentration or the dose. If you don't know how much is present, for instance, in the environment, if you don't know the concentration in the soil or a sediment or in, in the in the water phase. In fact, we cannot tell is this compound toxic or not. And this was already known by this scientist, uh, better known as Paracelsus, who said in the 16th century already, allerdings in gift und nichts on gift, allein die dosis macht das ein Ding kein gift is. And this can be translated as all substances are potentially toxic. It's the concentration or the dose that differentiates a toxic compound, compound from a non-toxic compound. And if we go back to the example of this uh, sodium chloride, for instance, ingesting already one, uh, as a single amount, one uh, big spoon of kitchen salt of sodium chloride can be already big, uh, lethal, can, can be already very toxic. Whereas consuming maybe a couple of nanograms or micrograms of PFAS or uh, dioxins or DDT, probably are harmless when it's just uh, on that moment, you will not experience any negative effect on that. But the second aspect that's very important when we are deciding if a compound is toxic or not is bioavailability. It's very well possible that you have two situations, for instance, two soils with exactly the same concentration of a contaminant, for instance, of PFAS, and I think Timo will give some examples on that, or of a metal, and that in one situation, the risk is very small, whereas, whereas in the other situation, the risk is very high because of differences in bioavailability. And that's illustrated for the aquatic environment in this graph, where you see the results of a sampling campaign where we sampled more than 50 streams and rivers uh, throughout Flanders. And we measured a lot of metals, dissolved concentrations of metals, and we also measured concentrations of these metals in biota. In this case, this was I'm looking for the pointer. In this case, these were concentrations in larvae of the non-biting midge of Chironomus. And what can be seen here is that in fact there is no significant relationship at all between the concentrations in the water, the dissolved concentration, and the accumulated concentrations. Even more, sometimes at very high concentrations in the environment, the accumulated concentrations were relatively low. And on the other hand, sometimes at low concentrations in the environment, the accumulated concentrations were very high, indicating that bioavailability is very important for the risk and as a, as a result also the toxicity of compounds. But there is another aspect that's important, and that are the conditions or the circumstances. You all know probably the company, the company Tessendrochemie, who is discharging a highly saline wastewater into a very small upstream river, in fact, in two rivers. So they are discharging, for instance, in the Grote Lake, which is a tributary of the Grote Neta. And the volume of that, of that discharge is almost equal or even bigger than the, than the discharge of the river, resulting in drastic or dramatic effects on the freshwater communities that are present there. If the same discharge would be in a saline or a brackish creek at the coast, probably this will not result in any effect of the on the communities that are present over there. So in fact, also here, the conditions, the circumstances are very important. And this is just an example for a saline effluent, but this holds for many com uh, contaminants or pollutants. So in fact, toxicity is relative, but this does not mean that there are no compounds and no chemicals of concern. There are indeed a lot of micropollutants that are of concern because they have the characteristics, the PP, PBT characteristics. And P stands for persistence, meaning that they last for a long time. They remain very long active in the environment because the degradation is very slow. 
That's why so, that some of these compounds are uh, called forever chemicals. Secondly, many of these compounds are taken up very easily by organisms and bioaccumulating in their tissues, for instance, in the fatty tissue. And finally, they may be toxic at already relative low concentrations. And a lot of these compounds have also the potential for long range transport in the environment, meaning that they can be detected in remote areas where there are no known sources, such as in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And I have to go to the next slide. Yes. And examples of this PBT, uh, PBT pollutants are, among others, some trace metals, not all of them, but for instance, cadmium, lead, and mercury, and mainly also POPs or persistent organic pollutants, such as uh, OCPs, which stands for organochlorine pesticides, uh, the PCBs, uh, brominated flame retardants, and the perfluorinated compounds. And because of this, compounds, these chemicals that have these PBT characteristics. A list has been published called the Stockholm Convention, which was published first time in 2001, and where 12 compounds, mainly uh, pesticides, were listed called the Dirty 12, and we, which for which the, the member state that signed this, um, this agreement agreed to try to prevent or to avoid the spread of these compounds into the environment. And here you see on the map in green all the state parties that signed this agreement. And notable is that on, among the non-ratifying states were the United States of America, Italy, Israel and Malaysia. A couple of years later, in 2009 and also in 2017, 16 new pubs have been published, again mainly pesticides, but also including compounds as uh, brominated flame retardants and PFOS. And currently there, currently there is a list of about 28 POPs that are on this list. Since I just told you that the compounds or the toxicity of these compounds is rather relative, and it's not sufficient to measure the concentrations in the environment, we have to see how can we assess the risk, the ecological risk of these compounds. And of course, this, has, this is done, this has been done in the past and is still done for new compounds and different approaches can be used for that. And the first more classical approaches are doing laboratory toxicity tests on, on a set of standard test species. In the aquatic environment, these are an algae, an invertebrate and a fish. But then it's very questionable if you can translate the results on these three standard species to the real situation, to the real field situation in a certain region. A second approach is looking to species sensitivity distribution where many species are tested and a value is derived that is protective of most of the species that are present in a certain region. So ideally in this approach, indigenous or at least uh, resident species should be tested to derive a safe value. But in both cases, this are laboratory toxicity tests where the situations in the lab are much different from the fields. As a consequence, also the bioavailability differs a lot in the lab compared uh, to the field. So it's really questionable. Can we translate the results of this laboratory toxicity test to, to the field? And generally, this is done by adding safety factors to, to, a, certain, to a certain concentration, but that's always very uncertain if this safety factor is sufficient or is maybe overprotective. And during the last decade, we did a lot of studies in our lab where we used another approach and where we related environmental or preferable accumulated concentrations of micropollutants in organisms that are present in aquatic systems to ecological effects. So we, we ask ourselves, can we derive safe concentrations that are protective for a freshwater community structure. And this is done by relating here on the X axis the concentration in the environment, for instance, in the water or in the sediment, or the accumulate concentration to an ecological quality index. And this is generally done by sampling in the field at several sites, macroinvertebrate communities or fish communities. And from these samples, calculate quality indices such as the multimetric index of Flanders based on the macroinvertebrate community, 
or the fish index based on the community structure of the, the fish that is present. Simultaneously, at the same sites and from the same samples, organisms are collected in which the concentrations of micropollutants are measured. And now we try to relate these accumulated concentrations by to the ecological quality by constructing uh, scatter plots. And we try to find a value, a safe value, safe value above which the ecological quality in here, for instance, this blue dotted line is the, the safe ecological quality is never uh, reached. And this can be done by calculating the 95 percentile of all, all sites, all samples that are above this uh, safe ecological quality. And from that safe concentration, maximal concentration, accumulated concentration can be calculated above which the ecological quality is always below the thresholds of, for instance, for the multimetric index of Flanders, 0.7. And I will illustrate this with some examples we did in our lab. This is from a study where we pulled several data, several studies where we pulled the data of accumulated concentrations with the data on the multimetric index. And from that we could calculate, we were able to calculate safe accumulated or body burdens of several compounds. In this case, these were metals. So above this concentration, for instance, if of cadmium, the MMIF was always lower than 0 0.7. So this is for invertebrates. And we also participate in study of for the Flemish Environment Agency, where we study the compliance of uh, the ecological quality of biota, so biota quality standards. And this is a, a map from the last four years where, where we sampled at 44 sites fish, but also where we exposed mussels at several sites. So we did a combination of passive biomonitoring. This was in cooperation with the IMBO, where fish were captured at all these sites. And we selected for two species, perch and eel. And at all the same sites, we also exposed mussels in cages that were, that were exposed for about six weeks, where after they were collected again, and we measured the uh, concentration of a set of uh, contaminants. And then again, we tried to relate this concentration in the organisms, in this case in the muscles, to the ecological quality, to the MMIF, and we could derive from that safe accumulated levels. And this is the example for muscles, but we also did it for eel. This is from an older study where we combined a big database from two big databases from the IMBO, where we combined the concentrations in eel in the muscle of eel of several compounds with the fish index. And again, we could calculate from this combination of data sets safe accumulated levels as shown here in this graph. And the last slide I would like to show us from for PFOS, where we also measured PFOS and other PFAS compounds, but this is just an example in perch and related again this to an ecological quality. And what was interesting the safe concentration that we derived from this study, from this uh, exercise, was uh, very comparable or very close to the bio, to the quality standard, to the biota quality standard. So the biota, biota quality standard was also protective of the ecological quality of the different systems. And that brings us smoothly to the perfluorinated compounds. So this was very fast, maybe in, in, in a nutshell, uh, of an introduction on how ecological quality or ecological effects of pollutants of concern can be uh, assessed. Thank you for this overview. Leven, are there any questions for Leven? I see two hands, but they were already up for quite some time. Oops, I see one hand. Jan Jacobs. Jan, you have a question? Oops. And that hand is gone too. <laughs> so, are there any questions for Leven at the moment? Tessa? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, at one of the, the, the first slides, you talked ab uh, about bioavailability mm -hmm. and you showed already the concentration in water. Yeah. Uh, I'm all, always working with soil, so I was always thinking, well, the part which, which is present in the soil and goes into the water, 
is bioavailable, but you probably look different at it. So what? how do you yeah. define bioavailability? Yeah, uh, I agree, especially when we look to sediments, for instance, but it also holds for soil and, and pore water. Um, when it's present in the soil and it's attached to particles, it's even less available than when it's present in the water. But even when it's present in the water, a lot of factors such as pH, the hardness of the water, temperature, uh, other factors, uh, the, the presence of organic ligands that are present can absorb these pollutants, making them less bioavailable. So it's very well possible that you have one situation with a very poor or very little amount of, of organic matter where most of the pollutants are bioavailable. And in another situation at the same total concentration, dissolved total concentration, there's a lot of organic matter, uh, a lot of organic material, and they all bind these contaminants, giving a very big difference in the bioavailability, even when it's present in the water. Okay. And how do you in the water determine, uh, for instance, the bioavailability? Very, very difficult, almost impossible. Okay. Uh, you, you can you can do it for metals sometimes with uh, ion selective electrodes. But that's not possible for all kinds of metals. It's very time consuming, very uh, expensive as well. So it makes more sense to measure in biota than measure in the environment, I think. OK, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Other questions for Leven? I'm looking around. I don't see any more questions. Then we move on to. Oops, there is a question from Lars, Lars van Passel. Yes, uh, Lieven. Out of curiosity, uh, what? How many? How many samples did you have to take uh, before you could derive this kind of graphs? Yeah, I think that's that's a very good question because I think everything falls with the amount of data that you have, and the more the better. Like the study on the chironomids, we had more than 150 samples. It was a data set from between 1990 90, and 2015, so it was a very big data set. I think the, the, the lower the number of sampling sites, the higher the uncertainty. And um, yeah, it's difficult to, to now to, to say how many you minimal need uh, I've seen studies where they only used in the UK, they only used like 20 sample sites, which in my opinion is really not enough to have a, a robust uh, analysis of this. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Looking around whether there are any more questions. If not, we move ahead to Timo. If further questions might pop up, leave and I think you yeah. will be present for uh, the next half an hour. OK, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I will yeah. stop my sharing. Yeah, thank you. Then Timo, the floor is yours. OK, yeah, you should see my presentation now, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. OK, yeah. So yeah, I will be mainly talking about uh, the bioavailability, the bioaccumulation and ecological effects of PFAS, which um, a main emphasis on what is known in literature and also show some of our own results. So first of all, um, this is quite general information, but PFAS are um, released due to diffuse and direct emissions, and they are transported in the global environment, mainly due to two different pathways. So first of all, you have the global atmospheric transport pathway, which is mainly relevant for volatile precursor compounds or volatile PFAS. And secondly, there is the global transport pathway uh, in the ocean where PFAS can be distributed also over long distances and reach remote areas such as the Arctic. Um, close to these points of emission, we see that, uh, for example, close to manufacturing sites, we see that concentrations of PFAS are often uh, very high compared to sites further away. And these results are from a study that we did in 2016 um, where we looked at four different, uh, five different sites, sorry, uh, starting from the 3M site here in, in Zwijndrecht up to Fort 4 in Mortsel. And we saw that the concentrations in soil decreased uh, steeply with distance from the 3M site for uh, almost all of the PFAS. We also saw the same pattern for PFAS in isopods, that there was a very steep decrease. And we saw the same decrease in um, eggs of 
uh, small songbirds, the great tit. We also saw that these concentrations decreased uh, sharply. Nonetheless, we also saw that the concentrations of these legacy PFAS, such as PFOS, which have been phased out or regulated already since the early 2000s, were still very high in the environment and in uh, biota. The behavior of PFAS in the environment, and particularly in solid matrices such as soil and sediment, depend on their chemical, but also the media and site-specific attributes. So some PFAS are more uh, mobile in water because of their shorter chain length, they are more hydrophilic and they will tend to stay in the aqueous phase, whereas the longer chain PFAS, they are more hydrophobic and they will show in hydrophobic interactions with organic matter and they will prefer to absorb to solid matrices. So in this figure, you can see an example of a mineral, uh, mineral particle with some surface charges on it. Now you can see that there are different interactions possible between PFAS and the soil particle. And these are hydrophobic ones, there are elect electrostatic ones, there's the presence of divalent cations where they can find uh, form bridges. And of course, this, the, the surface charge of these PFAS molecules, but also of these uh, uh, soil particles also depends on the pH, for example, of the soil. Uh, it also depends a lot on the amount of organic matter that is present in the soil. And therefore, to come back also at the question that, that Tessa just asked, I believe that especially for PFAS in soil, the bioavailability to organisms um, depends also a bit on what you're looking at in terms of the, the species. So the PFAS that are more present in the aqueous phase, they might be more available for uptake by plants whereas those that are uh, absorbed to the soil particles are not. However, when you look at an earthworm species that con really consumes and ingests these soil particles, these long chain PFAS might become more bioavailable. This figure shows an example of uh, PFAS in vegetables that we measured uh, quite close to the 3M site here in Zwijnvecht. And on the um, y-axis, it says the sum PFAS concentration. So it's the sum of all the PFAS that we measured. And on the x-axis, it's the distance to 3M in meter. And you would expect concentrations to decrease again with distance from 3M, but this is not necessarily the case. And we also found, uh, more interestingly, we found some concentrations to be very high in vegetables, whereas the soil concentrations were quite low and vice versa. So this suggests that there are uh, effects of bioavailability on these data as well. Then in terms of uh, bioaccumulation, the uptake of PFAS by organisms also depends on chemical species and tissue specific attributes. Uh, I will go a bit further in detail on that soon. And also something shown here on the figure are some of these very general uh, bioaccumulation metrics, such as the bioaccumulation factor, the biomagnification factor, and so on. And these are factors that are often used to express bioaccumulation. And in a few slides, I will just give my ID on why I think that these factors are currently not really optimal for use for PFAS. So in terms of species specific differences, we saw in Vlietbos, a site approximately one to two kilometers from 3M, we saw that uh, different plant species uh, take up different PFAS, but also different concentrations of PFAS, both in their fruits on the left and in the leaves on the right. And you can see that there's a large difference in the type of PFAS that is accumulated, but also in the concentration of a certain PFAS that is accumulated. And this is likely due to either bio uh, differences in bioavailability or for example, differences in protein content of the plants, differences in root depth. So different plant species might be exposed to different PFAS depending on how deep their roots are uh, and other attributes. We also saw the same in uh, groups of invertebrate species, although it's not very clear from the figure in the gastropods and the isopods, we did observe uh, bioaccumulation of PFBA, which is a short chain uh, hydrophilic uh, PFAS which was quite dominant in the plant tissues. And this is interesting because the gastropods and isopods, they are uh, herbivorous and detritivorous organisms that consume plant materials. Whereas the other three taxa, they are more carnivorous species. 
So this suggests that these short chain PFAS, they can be taken up by organisms at higher trophic levels, but to some extent they are just uh, not taken up by carnivores, probably depending of course on the uh, degree of exposure. But again, you can see that there are clear differences in bioaccumulation depending on the species. When we look at tissue specific differences, um, you can see in the study by uh, Ngu and Hungerbuller that there are differences in correlation coefficients uh, between the different PFAS and the associations with the phospholipid content and the albumin content. So there's also a difference between the different PFAS that they investigated. There's a difference between the three species that they investigated, and there's a difference between albumin levels and phospholipid levels in terms of the correlation coefficient. And this means that the affinity of PFAS is um, differing widely. They are proteinophilic, so they prefer, uh, or many of the PFAS, they prefer to uh, accumulate in protein rich tissues compared to lipid rich, rich tissues. And PFAS. Um, the PFAS show some binding site specific interactions depending on the type of PFAS. Um, I'm not entirely sure about the exact mechanisms behind this, um, but it's, it's very interesting to see that certain PFAS accumulate in, in other tissues than others. And this all depends on, on the species, on the type of protein that you're looking at and so on. So to come back at these bioaccumulation metrics, uh, quite often these bioaccumulation factors and bioconcentration factors are determined in a classical way for persistent organic pollutants. So these are often lipid normalized, but as I showed you in the last slide, uh, PFAS are more or have a higher affinity for proteins rather than lipids. So these are just some considerations that we should take into account. So maybe protein normalization of these bioaccumulation metrics should be more relevant for PFAS. In addition, what happens quite often is that not the appropriate tissue is uh, chosen to represent the accumulation. And it is, for example, important to, um, to look at edible parts where you look at biomagnification or bioconcentration. So if we don't eat the liver of a fish, then there is no sense to, to determine these bioconcentration factors based on the liver of a fish for us. And finally, uh, something very important is that of course, these precursor compounds for PFAS, they can biodegrade or they can degrade in the environment. So how do we account for, for those precursors and field-based uh, accumulation factors and bioconcentration factors? Um, that is something that is still uh, unclear to me and how we should deal with that, with those kind of things. Then the largest part of my presentation will be on the ecotoxicity of PFAS. Um, I will show mainly some examples of literature of different taxonomic groups and where possible or where available, I will also show some data from our lab. And yeah, despite the regulatory and jurisdictional constructs for some PFAS, there is a, yeah, the, the data on PFAS ecotoxicity is scattered and strongly biased towards a limited spectrum of PFAS. So you can see here that almost 50% of the studies on ecotoxicity have been done on PFOS and PFOA, and uh, uh, more than 25% on uh, 125 other PFAS. So to a larger extent, the knowledge on PFAS ecotoxicity is still unknown. And in addition, many of these studies, they target the same um, small range of organisms. So when we look at invertebrates, the majority of studies have been done on PFOS and PFOA, which is general for all the taxonomic groups that I will uh, present. There are relatively many studies on aquatic invertebrates, whereas the data on terrestrial invertebrates is very limited. And most of the studies, they focus uh, more or less model organi on more model organisms. So they use Daphnia, they use midges, and for terrestrial invertebrates, they often use uh, earthworms and nematodes. Data on other invertebrate species is still very scarce. And the data is highly variable depending on the species and the type of chemical. So as you can see, the acute toxicity values, they have a very high variability. The same for the chronic toxicity values and for the terrestrial invertebrates, it's the same. So there's a high variability between the species and also the type of chemicals, which makes it very difficult of course, to, to use these data for ecological risk assessment. Uh, 
Um, the endpoints that are often included are very general, um, mainly on reproduction, development, mortality and growth. And uh, very sporadically, uh, mechanism based studies have been taken, uh, have been conducted. And something that was quite general in most of these studies is that the toxicity within the same PFAS class, so for example, within the sulfonic acid group, increases with carbon chain length. Uh, most of the studies that we did in our lab, considering the effects, they are targeting oxidative stress response. Um, very briefly, this means that uh, a certain pollutant or a certain stressor could induce the production of reactive oxygen species, and this could cause oxidative stress. And you can measure this in terms of lipid peroxidation by measuring the malondialdehyde content, or you can also measure the antioxidantia uh, by certain assays. So what we did is we exposed some uh, stills in 2018 in several sites in Flanders, four on Linken Uver, and one reference site in West Malle, where we looked at the bioaccumulation of 15 PFAS, and we tried to correlate these to the oxidative stress response in the snails. For statistical reasons, we had to group these, uh, these into principal components, the PFAS, and the PC2 here on the x-axis represents high concentrations of both PFBA and PFOS. So this is a combined uh, association. And what we saw is that there were quite a, uh, a few positive associations with some oxidative stress uh, biomarkers. So this suggests that there might be an increase in reactive oxygen species. However, since we did not observe any association with malondialdehyde content, um, this indicates that the antioxidant defenses might have been sufficient to prevent oxidative uh, damage to occur through lipid peroxidation in these snails. Then in fish, um, again, more than 90% of the studies on fish have focused on the classic PFCAs and PFSAs, with a lot of studies on PFOS and PFOA. Of course, in fish, this is a, a very well-known taxa. Uh, there's also quite a lot of data on ecotoxicity of PFAS present for this taxa, mainly because of the zebra fish, which is a model species. On marine fish, there is basically no knowledge uh, at all. And some very general endpoints, they include mortality, growth and reproduction, but they also looked a bit on uh, mechanism based studies and mechanism based toxicity. In general, fish were uh, more susceptible to PFAS pollution than invertebrates. However, again, you can see that there is a very large variation in acute and chronic toxicity values, which depends on the type of chemical that you're looking at and also the type of the, the fish species that you're investigating. Um, the effects on fish, as I said, there are some mechanism based studies. So the toxicity pathways are better understood than for most of the other ta taxa. And the effects are often triggered by activation of nuclear receptors or through oxidative stress or um, interactions with biological macromolecules. Amphibians, on the other hand, is one of the group with the least amount of studies. And if they are studied, only less than 10 PFAS are tested. The acute toxicity was generally low uh, compared to other organisms or to, to other groups. But as you can see, there's still quite some variation. Uh, and the same goes for the chronic exposure. The endpoints that are investigated are mainly on mortality, growth and development, so there's no mechanism based study there. Birds are a group that were. Uh, that have been used more frequently in ecotoxicological studies and the last couple of I think the last 20 years, there's also a large increase in using birds for PFAS monitoring. And many of these studies, they target PFCAs and PFSAs when looking at toxicity. Um, quite a lot of studies are lab studies on chickens, quills and mallards, whereas field studies are, are relatively scarce. And most of these studies show that the sulfonic acids are more toxic than carboxylic acids for similar chain lengths. So that's quite interesting to know that, uh, for example, PFOS is more toxic than uh, PFOA. Here they have done some uh, mechanism, mechanism based studies, but uh, in general, the majority of studies have focused on uh, growth, development and reproduction and survival. The, there's also a, quite some variation in 
the acute toxicity and chronic toxicity, depending on the endpoint that you're looking at. Uh, it's also highly variable among species, but I will come back to that in a few slides where I show some examples of, of our own study. And there are also some egg injection studies where they uh, spiked eggs with PFAS and they looked at embryonic survival and hatchability, which I personally find quite difficult to translate to, to natural situations. Um, so it's, it's, that's also maybe the reason why there's a lot of variation for PFAS in these uh, effect concentrations. And also this differs between species. So what we did is in 2016, we investigated the breeding success of great tits in Linker Uver and at Fort 4. Uh, these concentrations in eggs are shown here. They are uh, logarithmic transformed. So, but yeah, it's very important to keep in mind that for most of these PFAS, these concentrations were the highest ever reported worldwide, um, especially at the 3M site. Our objective was to investigate the relationships between multiple reproductive parameters and the PFAS concentrations in the third egg. Uh, we consistently sampled the same egg to prevent any variation between these nests. And again, we had to group them into different principal components for statistical reasons. So unfortunately, we were unable to really look at individual effects of these PFAS, which is uh, often the case when you do a field study. We did observe a negative association between PC1 score, which was affected by all the PFAS that are listed below, and the uh, hatching success of the uh, great tits. And um, this could mean that, for example, the parents have had a reduced fertility, or that uh, toxic effects on the development of the embryo may have occurred, but we are not sure about that. On the same, uh, we also found uh, a negative association between PC1, which were the same PFAS and the shell thickness. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, the, the only study that have investigated relationships with shell thickness and found a negative association. And of course, in the in the case of DDT in the past, there was a lot of uh, issues with reduced shell thickness, making eggs more susceptible to break, reducing the hatching success and so on. Um, however, we don't know the mechanisms behind this. So the formation of shells is very complex and is affected by many different steps, including some hormonal. And it is possible that some of these PFAS might have uh, an effect on these hormones therefore affecting the shell thickness. We also looked at oxidative stress in the same bird species by uh, relating this to the concentrations in their blood plasma. And we did this for both adults and nestlings. And again, you can see that uh, there was a decrease, of course, with the three, from the 3M site on, uh, further onwards. And again, these concentrations were among the highest ever reported worldwide. We did find uh, some associations between the first principal component and higher levels of protein carbonyls. And this could mean that antioxidant defenses failed in neutralizing the reactive oxygen species and that oxidative stress might have occurred. However, these protein carbonyls are also a sign of disease derived protein dysfunction. So we're not certain about that. When we look specifically at the nestlings, we found some positive associations with a few of these oxidative stress biomarkers, uh, glutathione peroxidase and catalase. And both of these biomarkers are uh, known to be involved in the first line of defense against reactive oxygen species. So it's quite certain that uh, this positive association has resulted in no oxidative damage because these antioxidant defenses were sufficient to eliminate all the reactive oxygen species. Um, I forgot one thing um, in terms of the reproduction. I should have said also that, uh, which I forgot, that compared to a study in, in the United States on three swallows, they found much stronger significant effects on breeding success in, at concentrations that were 100 to 1000 times lower than the ones we found at 3M. So this also shows that there's a, a large difference in, in sensitivity among these different bird species. 
Then in reptiles, uh, there are only less than 10 studies known, which is a really understudied group. And therefore, the, it's very difficult to link these endpoints uh, to, for ecological risk assessment purposes. So if we want to protect reptiles or want to have an idea on how they are affected, we should really increase the number of studies on, on this. But of course, for, for ethical reasons, it might be difficult. Then in mammals, on the other hand, uh, mammals are often used for uh, deriving toxicity reference values uh, for many PFAS and mechanism based studies have been conducted to also investigate the uh, effects on tissue levels, but also on uh, molecular levels and, and genetic levels. The toxicity depends a bit on the compound that you're looking at, as you can see below for PFOS and PFBS and PFHXA. And in general, um, the shorter chain PFOS are considered to be less toxic than the uh, more legacy PFOS and the long chain PFOS. However, if we look at the replacement compounds such as Gen X, they show a variation in the level of toxicity uh, compared to PFOS and PFOA. There are some studies that that report the, the same toxicity values compared to, for example, PFOA. But there are also studies that mention that Gen X is um, even more toxic or less toxic. So there's a lot of variation in that as well. And finally, uh, a group which I should also mention is plants. And in plants, the main pathway for toxicity is expected to be through oxidative stress, which causes morphological, physiological, biochemical and molecular changes which affects plant growth, development and productivity. However, the majority of the studies that have been done on plants did not use uh, environmentally relevant concentrations. So the 10% the inhibitory concentration was often much higher than the concentrations that were environmentally relevant. And often the soil concentrations were, were really ridiculously high compared to what is found in, in, in the world. So it, that means that it's very difficult to translate these results to natural situations. And furthermore, there is no real uh, information on uh, the mechanisms behind the toxicity. So it's a hypothesis that this is due to oxidative stress, but it has not been studied before. So to conclude, uh, some future directions for ecotox studies. Uh, it is known that PFAS are transferred also to offspring, so through eggs, for example. But the effects on multiple generation are often still not studied. Um, furthermore, mechanism based studies for many taxa are just absent. Um, although there is an understanding of the toxicity of many individual PFAS, we should also consider mixture toxicity to make it more environmentally relevant. And uh, we should test a broader range of phylogenetically uh, phytogen of organisms. Um, to assess the differences in sensitivity, which is also relevant for ecological risk assessment. And finally, since it is impossible to test all the different PFAS individually for toxicity, I think that we should use the structural activity relationships to predict the toxicity of certain PFAS based on their chemical structure and their physical chemical properties, uh, preferably by a comparative testing with well-known studies of well-known uh, well-studied PFAS such as PFOS and PFOA. And that was my presentation. Thank you, Timo, for giving us this very interesting overview on ecotox of PFAS. The floor is open to questions, and I see a question already from Sam Fontaine. Sam, do you want to pose it also early? Of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, Timo. I was wondering, for the, you presented a slide uh, for the concentrations of PFAS in vegetables uh, in relation to the distance of 3M. But mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, it, for me, it, it, it looked like the kind of uh, outlier. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, have you checked if there was no interference from other uh, PFAS sources, uh, other PFAS sites? Uh, we, we have not checked. Uh, whether other PFAS sources were present, but I know that uh, because we looked at different concentric circles around 3M, and I know that there are other sources present within some of these circles, but we, we didn't necessarily look at this, but I think we should consider this when we, uh, when we process this data further. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Timo. Other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I don't see any hands, meaning that either you were very, very clear or either everybody is longing for their afternoon coffee. Just looking around. I, I, I was just wondering, but it's it's probably a, a quite generic question to to leave in. Leave in. There has been, of course, very much attention to to PFAS um, for the last few years. Um, if if I ask you as a as a general question, um, what might be the the next chapter? Um, because uh, in our society we are we have been confronted with with very many. Toxins. Um, you've mentioned quite a few of them. Um, do you think we we might be confronted, let's say, the day after tomorrow, with with other compounds that we haven't investigated yet that thoroughly in in our in our soils, for instance? I'm afraid that's certainly possible. Yes, that that we because yeah, as a, as scientists, we and also as regulators, I think we are always running after the the chemical industry. So. Um, yeah, I think it's this may or may have been the top of the iceberg. So I, I think it's still possible that new compounds that we are not aware of will pop up and yeah become as problematic as PFAS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, I I see a hand popping up from Chris van Looy. Yes, uh, to to Timo. So so. You you mentioned that there's in, in different tissue there's different concentrations and accumulation. Um, would there be still or already some some model model species that you can identify for the different groups of species or? I think in in terms of accumulation, I am not sure if there are really model organisms. Um, it's, it's difficult, I think, in terms of accumulation, but. Um, what we are now looking at, for example, is the potential of, of phytoremediation. And we are planning to investigate whether, for example, more protein rich plants have a higher uh, affinity to be used or a higher possibility to take up PFAS from soil. And we are also, of course, trying to look at, at the combination using also uh, earthworms to take up maybe the lesser available PFAS from the soil. But yeah, it, it still depends a, a bit on which species you look at. But I think for other organisms or other groups of organisms, I cannot really say if there's like a model species in terms of bioaccumulation. Because, because for instance, in, in, in the studies uh, that I saw from, from the IMBO, you, you noticed that for, for the eel and for, for, the, for the perch, the the accumulation and, and, and the concentration was 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 quite had a, a strong different um, well reactions and 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 apparently the perch responded very much much more well linear to say so so I I was wondering can you say then we should uh, start identifying model species or to, for further investigations or just keep it general because we don't know uh, enough for the moment. Um, I think Lieven knows better than me, but I think that most of these studies that were done uh, on, on eel and perch in the past, they have not really correlated the concentrations, for example, to sediment and water, but I'm not sure. Yeah, they, they have been correlated. Yes. OK. Yeah, but of course, that study was not only for PFAS, but for a whole lot of other, in total, 13 different uh, compounds. And yeah, we had to to take the, the species that are most present and that, that are present at most sites. So there we are we're restricted, of course, we cannot choose. And it would have been interesting to measure in many more species, but there was no budget for that, of course, to compare them. Yeah. That's a difficult question because we also work with with these uh, caged organisms, which is promising. But then, of course, you have only one type of organism. You cannot do it with different species. Yeah, you can do it with different species, but you you are restricted in the selection of the species that you are able to cage and 
measure the pollutants. Sam? I have another question for you, Timo. I was a bit surprised by the units uh, which were uh, sometimes used for the for the toxicity effects. Uh, in some cases, th there was uh, mentioned in, in milligrams uh, uh, for a kilogram. And uh, I know from, uh, for example, from the EFSA study, it's about uh, nanogram the kilo, the, per kilogram. Uh, so I, I was wondering, is there a... Do, do you have an explanation for uh, for that? The 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 magnitude is it's a, a a very large difference in magnitude from uh, for me. Uh, this, this, this. Yeah, I, I think th those uh, very high numbers are particularly for the acute toxicity tests, and we also know that in our lab uh, we are now currently running some toxicity tests on on different. Uh, invertebrate species mm -hmm. for uh, two different compounds for PFBS and FBSA. And we also noticed that there is basically the, the acute toxicity is very low of, of many of these PFAS. And I think for the chronic toxicity. Um, I, I remember for, for the birds that there was a chronic toxicity for reproduction mentioned above 2.1 yeah. milligram for a uh, Per kilogram, uh, so I, yeah, but I think it's quite high. Uh, this, this, this. Yeah, I think that's mainly because of the the way of exposure. So that was the two point one milligram PFOS per kilogram of feed. So mm -hmm. it's it's not necessarily a concentration that should be present in the environment, but present in their feed. Um, I'm also not very sure on based on which uh, species that they have uh, determined these values. I I can yeah I have to look that back up. But it's probably on on chickens or quills. But there there, there are certain avian toxicity reference values for uh, derived by Newstat for, I think for eggs and also for plasma, and these values are also very high. So they were sometimes even higher than the values that we observed at the 3M side. Thank you, Garden. Yes, thank you, uh, Victor. Um, Timo, apologizing, but I couldn't follow the whole uh, lecture. You're muted. Okay. Yeah, something now, happened. I have unmuted you. Yeah. Okay, I could not unmute myself. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Victor. <laughs> Um, I could not follow the whole uh, lecture. Uh, I just popped in, but I had uh, a question regarding toilet paper as a source. Maybe you saw it last week in the press, and I was wondering if you uh, me measured the 6.2 DPAP. Did you did you measure them? Probably you have said it already, or or not. No, it, is it, it in is your not, batch? No, it's not in our batch. Uh, we are. Yeah, trying to optimize the method from different compounds and it's included yeah. in what we want to measure in the future, but at the moment we do not yeah. measure it. Yes, especially for, I think, aquatic, but also terrestrial, it might be a, a good idea. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in the results already, so a little bit of pressure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. It's two o'clock unless there is an urgent question, Johan, but that's the last one. Please go ahead. Okay. OK, thank you uh, for the possibility to ask my question. It's a very generic question. It's not an easy one, but um, uh, to your expertise, what will finally be the most important factor to to look for um, remediation values? Will it be the ecotoxicological um, factor or will it be the human toxicological factor? And I ask this question because if you look to the um, the numbers that have been um, put forward by the RAVM, um, the ecotoxicological values are more stringent than the human toxicological values. What is your uh, experience and how would you look to it? That is indeed a difficult question. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure. I think, of course, we need. I think the, the the human toxicity should so, anyways, be taken into consideration. Um, I think what is done quite often is that for, especially when you, for example, look at the species sensitivity distribution, they 
um, the, the objective is to protect 95% of your species or at least 95% of your species. So there's always a risk of losing certain species if you um, go above these, these concentrations. Um, I, I think in this case, if the ecological risk are more strict or the ecological values are more strict than the ones for human toxicity, then I think we should probably go for the most strict ones because ecological effects will eventually also be translatable to human effects. Um, not maybe necessarily on, on human health, but of course there could be um, effects on, on the economy if, if certain crop species can survive here. If um, if ecosystems get polluted further, then the, the nature values decrease and there are other risks involved as, as well. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add something to that, Levin? Because I saw you nodding most of yeah, the time. No, I, I agree with Timo, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it, I think it's also a political uh, decision no? to, to see what, what's the most important to predict. As biologists, we of course, we will go for the ecological <laughs> quality. Okay, thanks a lot. I don't see, yep. No more urgent questions and it's past two o'clock. So thanks a lot, Levin and Timo, for very interesting presentations. Thanks a lot, all of you also, for uh, for taking part in uh, this session. Um, I would also like to remind you that we this is the first of our series of four sessions. And next week, March 16th, at the same time, we have a session on PFAS destruction in water, via non-thermal plasma and defluoro. PFAS destruction solution through electrochemical oxidation. So feel free to be again with us and thanks a lot. Have a nice day going on and until the next time. Bye bye.